the buildings look look exactly the same. Is that a problem with the way we're training architects or is it a economic problem? The training architects, I don't want to go into the education sector, but I can say that, you know, education has definitely failed us. So for somebody who doesn't know anything about this field, they think, oh, you run an architecture firm build buildings, you make houses. That's true, you know, architects are seen sometimes or understood as people who design facades and make beautiful things and just focus on aesthetics, but it really is not about aesthetics. Welcome to the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Manna. Today on this series, we're talking about architecture um, and many other things with us is Wael Al Awad, who is the founder and principal architect at YOI. Um, Wael, welcome to Afikra. Good morning, Mikey. Thank you. You know, I wanted to have you on. I'll tell you when I first became aware of your work. Um, I first became aware of your work when there I couldn't move, uh, I couldn't scroll for f- more than 10 seconds without seeing ecstatic posts about the fact that you won this award, which for people in and around your world is like a huge deal, okay? So we're gonna talk about uh, the Golden Lion in a second. But before that, you're just a, you know, a, an architect, uh, somebody who cares about the field of architecture, who grew up in Beirut, um, who is working in and around the region um, and thinking about these, these big issues about architecture. Before you um, started winning awards, how did you think of yourself as a professional? I and mean, like, what did you think you were working on before you started getting sort of uh, recognition globally? That's a good question. I think, you know, the global recognition is actually nothing different, you know? It's just having uh, people uh, uh, listen to you more, you know, and it legitimizes what you're trying to say a little bit more. Uh, but in reality, you're still the same person. You're still doing what you really believe you should be doing and, and uh, fulfilling your uh, obligations in the field of architecture. Because architecture, you know, is a very uh, broad uh, discipline. Uh, it's not a, a, a discipline that's uh, very uh, much categorized. Um, and then, you know, Winning the Golden Lion was, of course, a, a, an amazing uh, achievement that we were able to accomplish uh, uh, for the United Arab Emirates Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. It put us, uh, it really shifted the office into a new category, uh, which, which was something that uh, we'd worked about 10 years towards, you know. So for somebody who doesn't know anything about this field, they think, oh, you run an architecture firm build buildings, you make houses, you build other buildings, you make other houses, right? Right. Like that, that's what they think. And then if they heard the phrase pavilion at the Venice Biennale, I would think most people would say, what are you doing there? And are you building a house over there? Are you building a building over there? Those are the only two options in people's minds. Um, so how do you connect what you do on a daily basis and the types of problems you think you are supposed to be solving to doing something like that in that type of space? Yeah, well, the Venice Biennale is an exhibition space where you, you know, you uh, present an idea to the world. It's like the Olympics of architecture. And that idea has to be relevant to the time you're living in, you know, and has to make sense to uh, uh, the global community as well as to the local community. So it has to work on on two scales uh, in that sense. That's true, you know, architects are seen sometimes or understood as people who design facades and make beautiful things and just focus on aesthetics, but it really is not about aesthetics. Um, You know, I think architecture is deeply rooted in a culture and it's presenting culture. Any building you you situate or you design in any, you know, in a specific site will have immediate implications on the vicinity or its direct area around it be it, uh, you know, the relationship with the neighborhood. And then also there's the relationship with the city. There's the relationship with the country. And it scales out and out and out and out. And, you know, buildings have to be designed to reflect your identity and your culture. 
And that is very important, something we really deeply believe in. And it also has to reflect your climate. Uh, you know, the problem with modern architecture, or let's say uh, standardization and international style of architecture, where buildings uh, could exist simultaneously in Beirut, Dubai, and Hong Kong, while each of these have completely different cultural, you know, backgrounds and d different identities and completely different uh, geography. So then completely different climates. And that doesn't make any sense to me, you know, and then we really have to think about that so that the buildings not only serve financial purposes for developers, but really also serve the city and its inhabitants, its users, etc. That is very important. That's the role of the architect, I believe. And we have a, a moral obligation also towards the uh, climate justice, human justice, all of that. You know, it's it's obvious obvious for me that the built the built world. Uh, when I go to cities like Dubai, Beirut, London, Tokyo, they all they look really really similar, right? But the food is very different. The music is very different. The you know, in many in some cases. Um, our clothing the is different. The clothing is different. The topography is different. Um, language is different. But the the buildings, at this point, look look exactly the same. Is that a problem with the way we're training architects, or is it a economic problem? It's just the square boxes are easier to ship, and and like what is going on? Why why do they all look the same? I mean. The training architects, I don't want to go into the education sector, but I can say that, you know, education has definitely failed us uh, because of all these uh, problems that we face and challenge with it today. We cannot say that, you know, education is not to play a role in these problems arising, right? So there is a big part in the education uh, sector. But I also think that... Uh, you know, capitalism, globalization, standardization plays a bigger role and where um, architecture has become a commodity. You know, you sell images today. Um, developers sell images before they even build the buildings. So they, they come out with funky images and it's all about which looks weirder, which looks cooler, which looks whatever, you know, glitzier, more bling bling. But, you know, that wasn't really what architecture was about. Architecture was, you know, de you know, if you look at history, it was about creating safe spaces for us to inhabit and occupy and also to, to you know, to practice our culture or activity, etc. Uh, but it, this has transformed over the years and we need, really need to rethink that. Okay, so let's say you, you're working on a problem. You get approached as a, as a, um, as a firm, you get approached to build um some amazing cultural center right any let's say in the somewhere in the gcc right you get approached to build some amazing cultural center um and you and your team dream up this amazing idea that is uh uses vernacular ideas and reflects the topography and the climate and the the materials and all that stuff <laughs> where is it most likely to where is the idea most likely to die? And where are they most likely um, uh, going to say, you know what, let's do a more sort of international um, style continental breakfast <laughs> style <laughs> right. that, that, you know, we're, we're more familiar with? Right. I mean, again, it's important, I think, to to define a little bit the word vernacular, right? Sure, please. And yes. and, and why we we uh, recently have adopted the the phrase future vernacular in the office, and and we you know the work focuses on that as a primary uh, principle, uh, and it comes really from uh, standardization. Uh, since, you know, we no longer feel that buildings uh, in any way reflect our culture or identity. And at the same time, they're built all from cement or steel, uh, which is m uh, material that is transported all over the world uh, and has become the standard, you know, 
palette that you you use in any in any building and uh, well that's a, another issue that we can discuss in more detail yeah, is the sustainability factor of these materials that have risen today that we were not aware of uh, 20 30 years ago and their co2 emissions etc um, while you know vernacular architecture is architecture that's built from materials found in your own environment right so in the past before globalization and standardization you wanted to build a a house in in lebanon you would go to your geography you would look at your material and you would use that material to build your own house and immediately that would reflect your context right and it also will reflect reflect your culture because it's your masons and there was a you know there was an it, there was a a strong craft in in the production or the creation of architecture and space so there were stone masons there were carpenters etc that worked together as as a team to build a house or or whatever building it within the context of of that city Similar in Japan, you know, you would go to your local context, you would find the material. That's why we have stone houses in Lebanon. We have mainly timber construction in Japan because that's the palette of materials that we have. But today, if the palette is immediately, w without rethinking, you know, it's like cement, it's taken for granted, right? You, you take that for granted. You say, oh, we should build with cement. Uh, then you're uh, you're immediately removing all the craft from the production of architecture and space, and you're giving the architect this supreme role, right? So the architect becomes this this figure that directs everyone, decides everything, and you know, um, he because in the past the architect would have a conversation with a stonemason to tell him like, this is the stone we found, this is the color, this is the shape. This is its load-bearing capacity. This is what we can do. So there is a give and take. So the architect had a more, uh, let's say, uh, team-integrated role. While now, you know, I get commissioned a project. If if I think in, in a very modern way, I would, okay, I'll design it. I'll just send the drawings, and they build it to my specifications. And if I don't like it, I'll say no and, you know, stand my ground without asking why because... You know, this is the the ego that's been built into uh, believing this is what the architect is. It's, al it's almost like you're three three D printing the building. Yes, exactly. It's almost like uh, the same the same way. And and this is what created, I believe, the modern architect. You know, the architect that um, again has his image as the primary maker or producer of that building and. And then if you look at all architectural firms, they're always branded with the name of the architect, right? So you have the specific name associates or atelier or whatever, yeah. right? While it was a very conscious, conscious decision for us that we don't, I don't put my name on my firm. It's not like that, you know, it's, it's about a team working together. It's not about me or, or what I produce as a brand or an image, you yeah. know? Uh, it's not a sketch that I can sell. You know, you do a sketch on a napkin, you send it out, and this is the building, etc. So when we, uh, to go back to your question, so when we're commissioned to build something uh, wherever, in the Gulf, uh, etc., we go out there and we spend a lot of time researching, you know, understanding the context, understanding the site, understanding the conditions around it. And, and this is why, actually, we... Um, we're very specific in, in where we operate, you know? I find it very difficult if you ask me to go design something right now in Europe because this is not my arena. I, I'm not familiar with Europe, you know? I've spent most of my life in this region. I understand the region. I understand its identity, its culture, etc. So I feel this is the right thing to do, you know? I, I know that I can do something that serves the the purpose of of the context you know yeah so that's very important it's yeah. really important so architecture it's almost like it's almost like you view your profession similar to a chef would 
view there is. Absolutely. And it's it's interesting you said like the continental breakfast because again, you know, you go to a chef and he, he has this very specific approach, right, to, to producing food. And if you realize all the famous chefs, etc., cuisines, they're they're about the local, right? It's about yeah. where you source your local fish, where you source your local meat, your local vegetables, etc. And then you go ask him, oh, you know, I want you to uh, do something in Sao Paulo. I want you to do something in Tokyo. It just doesn't make sense to us. It, it's, this is not the way things should work. Yeah. I want to talk about wetland a little bit um, in detail because I think it might open up a, a broader conversation about cement and about some of the ecological impact. Um, so if you can just sort of set the stage uh, about what the sort of problem you were interested in investigating um, in the, the 2021 UAE pavilion in Venice. Yeah, well, you know, as practicing architects, so we build, we're practicing, we're, we're, we, we have a lot of uh, projects that are ongoing. We're not only academics, so uh, we were really interested in um, uh, trying to find a local sustainable solution to uh, the building of projects in the UAE specifically at this time, or GCC, let's say. You know, as I mentioned, cement is the predominant material in the uae there's not much of a palette that you can select from right you don't have bamboo you don't have wood you don't have stone these resources are really limited and then we came to learn that cement is responsible for eight percent of global co2 emission right so if you compare that to countries it ranks third after china and the us it's a huge impact on the climate Today, we consume 30 billion tons of cement per year. It's projected by 2050, we'll consume 60 billion tons of cement per year. So the mathematics don't add up, yeah? Uh, can, I ask and, you, yes, can I ask so, you a question about uh, cement? Yes. Is cement more of a, a material or more of a technology? Like, Did we invent cement the same way we invented like plastic all of a sudden or like... When did cement become something, become part of the standard palette? Right. So this is, you know, uh, if you go back, Romans used cement, right? But they used a different kind of cement. So cement, there's a, a wide range of what cement is. Cement is more of a, a, a binding, like let's say a cementitious binding material, right? So the Romans had their own cement, but that, that had a different formula to the, the, the chemistry behind cement. The, even the Great Wall of China was built from cement, and that was a magnesium oxide-based cement, which is similar to what we presented in, in Venice, actually. So it dates hundreds of years ago. But ordinary Portland cement, OPC, is the problem. And OPC is the problem because it uses the, the binder that's being used is lime, and it's converting limestone to lime that emits a tremendous amount of CO2. It's, it's a chemical reaction that, that uh, ends up releasing so much CO2, almost a one-to-one -one ratio. So meaning to produce one ton of cement, you release one ton of CO2. It's really dumb material, extremely dumb material. But, you know, it came about being used in, in modern days and, uh, you know, after World War II, there was massive reconstruction that needed to happen at a very fast pace, etc. So cement became, you know, the go-to material because it really ticked a lot of boxes. It's an excellent material. Had, had, it, had it not have these huge sustainability uh, issues related to it, I would, I would not really argue against cement, right? But because we know today that we're in a climate crisis um, and we need to act responsibly, we can no longer say this is not my problem, you know, as an architect. Because I would say, I would tell you, like, a lot of architects think of themselves as designers or I just design the facade. It's not really my problem, the selection of material and its impact on the climate. This is something that a chemist should solve or the material industry should solve. But I, I don't believe that's true. You know, it's it's your responsibility. If you're using it, you should, you know, 
be held accountable for it. So we felt like, okay, if we're going to use this, we really need to justify why and how, etc. And this is where the, you know, our exploration started into an alternative cement material that could be used locally in the Gulf that is sustainable or eco-friendly, you know. Um, so uh, having understood that the problem is in the binder, we started looking at alternative binders that could be used within cement. And as I mentioned, like the Great Wall of China used the cement that's magnesium oxide based. So um, always this, the binders, natural binders are found in the geography, in your landscape, right? So we started walking around and driving around the, the geography of the UAE looking for an alternative binder. W what's there in the geography that we could use? And we came across the salt flats of the UAE, which are wetlands. You know, they're ca categorized under wetlands in, in the convention of, uh, 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 sorry, I forgot the name. It's a, it's a global convention that categorizes uh, certain geographies. Uh, then, you know, why wetland? Because Venice is a wetland and we also wanted to take a local story and connect it with a, a global story. And again, Venice, you know, it was built on a wetland and the, the, the way they were able to build it was through using wood piles that, you know, through the mud actually petrified and became a solid foundation for, for the building of Venice. And so the wetlands of the UAE have this cementitious crust, you know, it's, it's salt, it's basically salt. And we were captivated immediately by this cementitious crust. And I thought there's definitely a binder in here that's holding together or gluing all these minerals together. And the question becomes, what are these different salts that are working in, in creating these uh, uh, rocks of salt? Yeah. And through research, we then learned, okay, we, we're not really reinventing something. Siwa in, in Egypt is all built from uh, its local wetlands. So again, you go back to the vernacular. They had to build something from their local landscape. And it's the same in Chateaujur in Tunisia, yeah? where, where Star Wars Episode Four and Lars Homestead is. It's built from, you know, the local wetlands. Um, so we realized, oh, you know, this was even used in history uh, to really construct and, and create uh, architecture. But again, um, and, you know, it's quite a complex, a complex uh, story because uh, I also think going back to vernacular is not necessarily the answer uh, because even vernacular is based on the principle of extraction, right? So when we spoke that you want to build a Lebanese house, you go and take local stone, what are you doing? You're depleting resources from the natural environment. And, and in the past, that really made sense because the population was kind of small compared to what the population is today. We're 7 billion people. 2050 says, you know, we're going to be 10, 11 billion people. So a Bill and Melinda Gates report in 2019 uh, states uh, that we have to build the equivalent of one New York City every month over the next 40 years to accommodate this expanding population by 2050. Is that holding, I mean, I, not that you're the author of the report, but is that holding current lifestyle trends constant? Like, okay, yes. if, if, yeah. we wanna, it, if we all want to have the same type of houses and the same types of spaces, isn't that the thing that needs to change, maybe? Yeah, of course. That yeah. also needs to change. We need to rethink the way we live, the way, you know, the way we, we also, the way we, we, uh, we travel, the way we, everything, you know, every, some people have four or five houses today or two or three houses, right? It becomes a norm. You know, you have a house in this city, that city, that city. And then, you know, that adds, adds up to the, the amount of construction that needs to take place to accommodate 10 billion people. So if you really think of uh, vernacular being a solution, that I think is a problem because then what we're gonna do is consume all our timber, we're gonna consume all our stone, we're gonna consume all our natural environment. What's important is to rethink also the way we source our materials. And this is where 
you know, we were more interested in waste or, you know, a more circular type of economy than a linear type of economy. You know, if what if wastes could give us the materials that we need because we consume so much, we have so much waste, right? And, and this is where we actually thought, okay, we can't go and build with rocks from the wetlands because we'll consume them all within a couple of years. But then we found that we can, we can source all the same minerals and materials from the reject brine of desalination water, which the UAE is the third largest desalinator in the world. So we have a waste product, a byproduct that's there not being used and actually being used badly because it's currently it's being thrown back into the sea and it creates an environmental disaster in the sea. It's increasing the, the water temperature, killing marine life, killed all the coral life already. So the question, you know, the interest becomes and the question we raised also, I raised at the Venice Biennale is that can industrial wastes be the future vernacular of our cities? So rather than looking at the physical environment as the vernacular, why can't our wastes be our vernacular? Because they're very specific to our our cities also. Let's say the answer is yes, it can be, right? And policymakers get on board. And let's just, let's focus on the UAE since that's where you are right now. Um, and policymakers issue regulations, you know, we're going to start using this technique. We're going to focus on the circular economy. We're going to limit very drastically the use of cement and and all the things that you're advocating for. What would the, the shape of the city and the shape of life look like in 20 years? What is at stake? I mean, are we going to be making similar skyscrapers? Like, not possible. What, what actually changes? Not possible to make similar skyscrapers because this material is very different from ordinary Portland cement. This material, although is a cementitious material, but uh, currently, uh, it, you know, with the technology available, uh, it needs to be carbonated. Again, an interesting thing is that uh, we replace magnesium oxide uh, in the cement mix, not use lime. And for that to gain its structural strength, it needs to be carbonated, meaning it needs to absorb CO2 in order to gain its structural strength, right? So, and it absorbs 8% of its weight CO2, so it's also a carbon negative material. But this limit, the limitation of that is that it can only be produced in precast sections and not cast in situ. So it's, you can't design in the same way that you design with Portland cement. You know, structures yeah. are not intention, they work in compression. So automatically, uh, the UAE and what we build will start becoming very local and very unique and will be very different from what other cities have as architecture. Yeah, it's like those uh, those like the original skyscrapers in Yemen. Those right, yes, yes, yes. Those yeah. are uh, Shibam mm. in Shibam. So when you when you advocate for this type of stuff, what do policymakers say? Are they like what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and no, what is the response um, outside of the sort of um, thought experiment crowd? Right. I mean, again, uh, you know, uh, it's still an it's still an ongoing research. There's n there's not a definite solution yet, uh, but there, I can tell you that there is uh, a lot of commitment from the UAE government and government agencies in in trying to uh, create something different. Uh, not only. Uh, not only with this project that we presented, but they also launched a, a, a competition in the UAE called Rethink Brine, where they realized, oh, okay, we have a brine problem. And actually, it's not a problem. This is a commodity that we have that we could use somehow differently. And it could be used in the agriculture se sector. It could be used for the uh, uh, also pharmaceutical sector, etc., so there's a lot of support in, in trying to think outside the box and try to find alternative ways to how this could really work. But uh, but again, of course, you know, 
uh, it's driven, cities are driven by economies and, you know, economies uh, need speed, scale, etc. UAE population is, is also uh, increasing at a, at, a, at a very high speed, right? So, and you need to really build fast and quick. But I always say, you know, the solution I think it doesn't need to serve today, us today, but if it serves us 10 years later, that's excellent. You know, that's already an accomplishment. Uh, everything needs development and progress to bring into the system and standardize and test and make sure it's safe, secure, et cetera. And, uh, and that I think is, is just logical that, you know, it takes its time to, to also come into being appreciated and understood by all the stakeholders. Everyone has to really get on board. But it's just like, you know, any other harmful material uh, or harmful substance, like cigarettes and tobacco, yeah? In the past, in the modern age, it was like not taxed, etc. Today, it's heavily taxed. And I also advocate, like, why isn't cement heavily taxed? Right, it should be heavily taxed. Now the European Union is also preparing new strategies with the new European Bauhaus, where they will phase out cement by the next 20 years. That's their strategy and plan, or heavily tax it, so that you know, then it makes sense that you go to another material that might not be as uh, efficient, but then would commercially make sense. So it's, it's interesting though, right? Cause like in 1945, 1946, 1947, if, if we came to European regulators and said, Hey, listen, you need to tax cement. They'd be saying, no way we need to rebuild the continent. And we're coming out of a war. There's an enormous amount of, uh, construction that needs to happen. We need as much oil and as much cement as we can get to build this place and steel and all the things that need it. Right. Right. And at that time, actually CO2 was not an issue. We didn't know about CO2 emissions. I mean, that's why I say it, it's 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 become a problem in the in the last 15 years where we've become aware of that where the problem lies in climate change and it's in the CO2 emissions. Right. But even with the knowledge, right? Like uh, very famously, um, you'll hear our, uh, people arguing that, like for example, like China will say, you "No, know, okay, you guys are putting regulations. You're trying to impose regulations on us." while we're building up our economy that you would never have allowed to be placed on you. And it's convenient to place it on us now as we're building up. Or similarly in India, right? Right, right. This is, uh, yes, uh, absolutely. We're looking at um, very smart people who care about, I think, care about the environment, but also care about the strength of their economies, specifically in, in the Gulf right now, who are saying, okay, we want to do right by our future selves. <laughs> I like us in 20 years and our kids and our grandkids, we want to do right by them. But at the same time, the population of Riyadh is growing like crazy and we need to build stuff. Are there other people in your field who are attacking similar problems from other vantage points that you're saying, okay, amazing. This person at least is talking about this. I'm thinking about cement. What are the other problems that could be used to help balance the this calculus, both sides of the equation, the future version of us and today's version of us. Uh, you mean as architects? As architects, yeah. Yes, yeah. of course. I mean, this is today on like the hotspot of architecture around the world, right? So yeah. everywhere around the world, a a Asia is looking at, at, at the problem in its own perspective. Europeans are looking at it from their own perspective. Um, and you have architects that really are addressing these issues in uh, on local scale. I think it's difficult to think of it on a global scale. You should, if you address your problem locally and solve it locally, and each country starts to deal with its own local problems, yeah. then that will create the global balance, right? Like even uh, you can see the support, Francis Kere winning the Pritzker also, and his work in Africa and how the way he builds from local materials and his story is amazing, you know? He, he, and, and, and there's a, an education to the people too, because when he went to Africa and he said, oh, you know, to his community, we're going to build a school and guess what? We're going to build it from our local mud. You know, people were not happy. 
You yeah. know, they wanted a modern building that looks something like something in Germany where he's coming from. They didn't want that. But then he had to explain to them, educate them. Then they began to understand what's the value of that building and why we should do it this way. Uh, and then, you know, and then that started, you know, building, you know, it started creating an effect where he was able to build a much larger community uh, or, or much larger array of buildings uh, from their local uh, resources. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, what city do you feel like you know best? Oh, a good question. I mean, I've spent a lot of my life moving around. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I was born in Lebanon, but I grew up, you know, with the start of the war traveling around, uh, not being stagnant in one place for too long. But then we settled in Cyprus for about nine, 10 years, I would say, um, where, you know, I, I spoke Greek. I went to, to school there. And where in I, Cyprus? I was born in, in Larnaca, Cyprus. in Larnaca. Oh, I went to the American Academy in Larnaca. Ah, interesting. Yeah. We have a parallel, parallel lives. Okay. So then, you know, yeah. we went back to Beirut after the war. And then uh, I finished my high school in, in, uh, in Beirut and then went into the American University of Beirut to study architecture. So I stayed in Lebanon for about, say, 12 years at that time. And then I decided, you know what, after I graduated, I want... I want to uh, practice architecture somewhere different, somewhere more inspiring. So I moved to Japan and then where I spent eight years uh, practicing with various architects there in Tokyo. Uh, so I also Tokyo became home for me. And, uh, and then after a while, I felt, OK, you know, I want to set up my own office. I went back to Beirut. Uh, thinking I would establish an office in Beirut. And for obvious reasons, I thought, you know, Beirut doesn't really work. It's, it's not uh, also big enough for me as a city. It, it was quite limited and there were a lot of regulations that prohibited uh, me from creating an international firm the way I saw it. So then I said, you know, Dubai is, a, is an excellent uh, alternative. Moved to Dubai, I've been here for 14 years now. So, you know, I would say I'm, I'm very, very familiar with many cities uh, around the world um, and very familiar with Central Asia too because when I practiced uh, architecture in, in Japan, we had a lot of work in Central Asia for the Aga Khan. Uh, that was in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. And now in the UAE, I'm here, but, and we have a lot of work in Uzbekistan. So I'm also back connected with Central Asia. And we still have an office. We have an office in Tokyo, which connects and produces the work for the uh, Japan market, let's say, or Japan and Vietnam and, and the region there. So that, you know, we, we operate contextually or, or locally somehow. Yeah. So of these places, which of them do you think is embracing this idea of future vernacular um, most? Uh, I think the UAE, you know, I think the UAE is mostly current because I'm really getting a lot of support locally from, for this idea. Uh, Japan actually, you know, it's a much different uh, approach to architecture and design. The paradigm shift is just starting. Uh, it hasn't uh, kicked in yet. Um, sustainability in, in the way we build is seen in a different way. Um, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I would say that they view sustainability in a more pragmatic way, similar to maybe the Americans do, where, you know, they bring in lead or bream or, you know, these fancy uh, stand, standardized things where, you know, you, you uh, create a checklist of okay how sustainable are you and you can be gold certified etc uh, through fulfilling certain uh, requirements that are set by a, a body that decides what is sustainable and what is not sustainable right while while from here it's being rethought from its root cause you know it's like rethinking the whole system rather than just 
but again, you know, the UAE is a tabula rasa, right? So it's still, there's a lot of space for growth and innovation, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, youth are at the, uh, uh, let's say, the, uh, the front line, right? While in Japan, the youth are in the very back line. It's, uh, it's you know, people there that, that are leading everything are there for the past 60 years. So they're very, um, let's say, uh, stubborn mentalities, okay? Where shift is much more difficult. Change is difficult, you know? There's a lot of kind of hesitation and resistance to this. Uh, while while you, it's important, when where you have youth driving the the country also, it makes a big change because youth, you know, they're not really uh, deeply rooted into old ways and are very happy to adapt and try new ways. Let me ask you, it's going to be a weird question, but I'll ask you, are we stuck with high rises? Are our cities always going to have these global cities like Dubai? Are we stuck with them like an unfortunate tattoo that we got in our 20s that we kind of wish we could get rid of, but no, what are we going to do? We're, we have this just rows and rows of rows of kind of half empty high rise buildings that are just being held as investment properties. Like, are we stuck with it? Is there a way to undo these unfortunate tattoos? The, the question, you know, th this is a very good question. And I think this is also, you know, really driven by market economies. Yeah. yeah. And not, uh, and not more than that. Yeah, where you said investments are are buying into these buildings, just you know, you don't want to put money in your bank. You invest there; it goes up twenty percent, etc. You sell it out. It's you know, it's a way of kind of uh, building the economy, building your money, building etc. And it's not really the places where people want to inhabit, right? It's not really, I think. And when COVID hit, I think, you know, everyone in a high rise were like, was like, oh, my God, why am I in a high rise? And, you know, e even in, all over the UAE, they started looking for villas to rent or houses to rent because they realized, oh, if I'm going to get stuck in here for uh, a couple of months, I don't have a window that opens. I can't get any fresh air. I can't go out to a balcony. Yeah. It's a massive problem. You know, it's not a place where I want to live. And also the problem with that was the office was becoming more the home. And it's, again, tied to the idea of, of you know, capitalism, I would say, and that thinking, you know, all these big corporations would do you very fancy offices where they want you to spend more and more time in the office, more and more time working, where your house just becomes a bed, right? You know, no more than, than that. And then when you had to work from home, and then you realized, oh, it's more, it should be more than a bed. You know, this doesn't work for me. So I think high rises are not really ideal places for people to inhabit. They don't want to. So it's not like driven by people's uh, 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 want or need or, you know, their requirements to build high rises, but it's more driven by uh, investments, etc. cetera. Uh, where you know you get the, you maximize the value of the land to build vertically, I, I you know I find horizontal uh, connections are much stronger than vertical connections. Again, why? Because I want to connect to the earth. I want to connect to the ground. You know, yeah. and it's and it's and it's uh, it's also sad to see that a lot of impoverished countries or countries with a lot of uh, poverty on the street, etc. They tend to build higher just to escape the reality of what's happening on the street. You know, I went to I went to New York uh, last year, uh, and I went for a walk, and I was like, oh my god! You know, the streets are just horrific. The amount of of just poverty you feel on the street. So then I, I started thinking, of course, that's why they're building high rises. They're running away from, from what's happening on the street life. They're going up vertical. The higher they go, they go, the higher they disconnect or relate to this reality that's on the street. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's just unfortunate. And I think, I mean, 
I think not a lot of a lot of cities also are about towers, right? It's not like that. Japan doesn't have, uh, I mean, maybe uh, the business districts, which are a small uh, portion. Even Dubai, I think it's a misconception that high rise dominates the city, right? It's Sheikh Zayed Road with these towers, but today you look at what's being built. Uh, uh, Dubai South or Dubai towards Al Qudra Lakes or the uh, the Jumeirah One, okay, all these areas. These are all low rise areas, right? But it's the high rise, I think, that that uh, creates a, a hype for the investors, etc. You know, it looks yes. it's it looks like oh, this is the uh, the future uh, kind of city. But what do you think happens to those? I mean, if if you were in like 40 years, 50 years, what do you think happens to those types of places where maybe we're coming to the conclusion like, who wants to live there? Who wants to be there? I mean, what what happens to those types of places and those types of spaces? I mean, the, I've, I've all once looked into an idea of cre uh, transforming a, an abandoned high rise into a vertical farm in the yeah. city of Dubai. And I think that makes sense. I mean, you have a vertical structure where you can really you need to grow agriculture, etc. In Dubai, uh, the land is not uh, is not fertile, so you know you need to grow through hydroponics, etc. In a different way, right? So it makes sense that you start to occupy, for example, these high rises with vertical farms that feed your city, and they're quite central to the city, meaning you don't have to ship or move your produce uh, to to uh, across large distances. Let's say, yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of architects that are are thinking along those lines. I, I you know I've seen a lot of projects and examples that are starting to follow these uh, trends of rethinking these abandoned tower structures and what do we do with them and how can we integrate them rather than just demolish them. I, a place like Dubai, when I think about architecture and sort of like lived experience as we as we move forward, climate change, lack of water, you know all these issues. Um, the understanding that cement is an issue. Um, I feel like there's this like increase, like ever growing list of reasons why life is going to be hard in places like in places like Dubai um, going forward. Um, do you feel like on a daily basis, people who live there who are not engaged in this work understand the sort of the root? some some of these underlying issues is this is there a common awareness about this um, i think there's a common awareness on sustainability today so every consumer is always questioning you know uh, his choice i mean is this the right choice that i'm buying this product or from this even supermarket or this you know if, am i using a plastic bag or not am i taking so consumers are becoming more and more aware of you know, the, the climate uh, situation and how can we uh, play a role in that, you know, and, and but I also think it's honestly uh, an, a misconception, let's say, because I don't think if you uh, stop, uh, if you shorten your shower time, you're going to save water. That's not true. You know, that's that's not true at, at all. I mean, we know on the planet, uh, water consumption, the human, the all humans only use 8% of water consumption. You know, the rest is by agriculture and mega production facilities. So we should, again, go and re-question the ways and the systems that are producing and creating the infrastructure for our cities and not only guilt trip us, you know. Oh, if you use your bicycle to work, we're going to cut on CO2 emission. No, it's not going to really make a difference. It will, but it's not going to make, it's not the game changer. The game changer is really addressing the elephant in the room and not trying to guilt trip individuals because it, again, it's a game, you know, it's a game that corporations play to say, no, it's not our fault. It's your fault. You know, you're using plastic bags at the supermarket, but it's not the plastic bags at the supermarket that, creating the mega waste in the in the sea the mega waste of plastic in the sea are the fishing nets and the mass industry of fishing so we should address that rather than address the 
the consumer, but they want to guilt trip you and and shift the blame game. You know, uh, you play that that different uh, different way of of addressing things. But I think again, I mean, uh, uh, Dubai uh, is creating a a, uh, a an infrastructure for its inhabitants that is is uh, always being re-questioned uh, so that it becomes more efficient, more also uh, uh, appropriate for its times, let's say uh, the 21st uh, century. And they, I mean, I feel there is a keenness in, in trying to really uh, be a leader somehow. There's really an enthusiasm, a... a a, a desire to to lead in in uh, in these uh, models, and it's only possible here because again it's a relatively new city, and they have the ability and the flexibility to test things out. Right, it's a tabula rasa that is a good place to test things out. While if you go to Beirut, it's kindly impossible. Right, the density of Beirut, the density of Tokyo, the density to to rebuild infrastructure or to recreate infrastructure is extremely difficult, and is it, and uh, it's more uh, uh, there's more resistance or there's more challenges to solve than trying to build something from new and set up from new. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's funny because like it's hard for me to wrap my brain around this a little bit because usually. Um, these types of places um, lead with ambition, right? Ambition, speed, strength, and momentum, <laughs> efficiency, sort of like uh, surging forward, right? And to create waves, global waves, and 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 to create um, to to really make a name for themselves, right? Whereas I feel like the first part of our conversation has all has been about largely making yourself small and almost focusing on on the local ingredients and what you can do with the most minimal impact and what you can do um, not at the fastest rate and not to make waves, actually to make the opposite of waves, to, to, to not disturb. So I'm curious, how how can we do it? How can places that have the ambition to figure out solutions to climate problems. Um, manage the ambition to go fast and to go hard and to do all those things with the understanding that speed and that type of brute force often causes the problems that you're trying to solve. Yes, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult, I think, a situation to, to balance all these things together. I mean, yeah. I, I don't have an answer to it. Yeah. You, I, you can't tell I it to me in 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I, I unfortunately, I wish I had an answer and then our, the whole climate crisis problem would be resolved. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, again, it's all about, uh, uh, yeah, it's about focusing on your local. And I think, again, it's about uh, engaging in cross-cultural dialogue. That's very yeah. important, right? And and uh, and uh, openness to uh, new ideas. That's very important too. So that you don't, you know, you you test things out. You can't. I mean, the systems that have failed us, the systems yeah. we currently operate under, they have failed us. There's no question about that, yeah. right? Even the educational system that we operate under has failed us. And whoever argues otherwise, I think is not really admitting to the reality of carrying any responsibility. And I think the, the, the point that change starts is when you say, I am responsible, yeah. you know, you admit that you have a responsibility to carry and that you should do what you think is the right thing, uh, regardless of uh, what others think. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, sure. It's a moral obligation that you have to take a stand towards. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think if you focus on nurturing and building your own city in an appropriate way and a, a, a an appropriate way and a, a clever, smart way that's 
using the technologies of the 21st century because technology is not a bad thing. Some people think, oh, robots, if they come, they'll take over. That's a, that's a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, if you have to balance it out. Again, technology, for example, in our research has helped us redefine magnesium oxide cement, right? So it's it's if you put it to good use, it can serve you in a better way. Yeah. Uh, and then you can, you know, uh, use your own context to to develop and test uh, the buildings of uh, infrastructures, etc. Um, before we wrap up, I'm curious what other projects you're working on right now. Uh, there's a lot of we're doing a lot of work actually now. We're working uh, in Abu Dhabi on uh, Misa. Uh, which is Mina Zayed uh, district, yeah. and and it's I don't know if you you know Warehouse Four Two One. Yeah, yeah. So it's all the area Phase One around uh, Warehouse Four Two One. We're reconverting that into a design district, Abu Dhabi design district. Uh, uh, you you know through uh, sustainable ways of recycling the existing steel, etc., and keeping the identity of what's there. Uh, it's not going to be a, a a new uh, development, but it's actually a kind of working with the existing in order to introduce and uh, inject new programs, etc., and bring, bring uh, um, a community of different designers together uh, in Mina Zayed. So that's one very interesting project that we're currently uh, focused on, and we've already appointed a contractor. Construction will start very soon. Um, oh. Uh, we're also working in Uzbekistan, uh, which is, again, uh, a very interesting pr a project in Bukhara. Uh, Bukhara is a city uh, that uh, was one of the biggest uh, uh, cities of the Islamic Empire on the Silk Trade Route, right? Um, it's uh, UNESCO-listed heritage site, the whole city uh, itself. And there we are actually creating a cultural district where that will host a, uh, uh, let's say, a Biennale of Art in 2025. But the aim is not to host a Biennale. The aim is actually to kind of reconnect the city of Bukhara to the global and international uh, map. Because in the past, you know, in the 15th century, Bukhara played a huge role um, in science, in medicine, etc., uh, you know, Ben Sina, uh, he came from Bukhara, actually. So, you know, the inventor of modern medicine. And unfortunately, they've fallen off the map with, uh, with the, you know, the disappearance of the silk trade route, and then you had the airplanes, etc. So you didn't really need to travel by foot anymore. And it's that how to reconnect that to the global ma uh, map, especially that they have an extremely rich uh, craft scene, extremely rich, you know. Their craft is amazing. You, you know, you've definitely heard of the Bukhara carpets, the yeah. Suzani also craft of, of weaving, uh, ceramics, etc. So uh, it's a very exciting and interesting project that also uh, we're uh, focused on. Other projects I unfortunately cannot uh, disclose. So, yeah. Super interesting. Um, well, I'd, before I let you go, I want to ask you if there are um, any books you think folks who are listening to this should read if they are interested in learning more about architecture, sustainability, um, some of the these ideas that we discussed today. I mean, there's a there's a very uh, uh, nice book called uh, Architecture Without Architects. I think that's a great book to read where, you know, uh, again, it's looking at uh, the different communities around the world uh, or, or spaces. And I think Shibam is in one of them, the towers in Yemen, where, you know, they were not really built by architects, but by built by the local communities. And they really showed how communities understood their context, understood their climate and built architecture that was very contextual and suited and, and worked for their specific uh, needs. Um, that that's a good book. Uh, again, I don't focus on reading books based on sustainability. I'm more interested in in a diverse array of things. You know, from also sure. 
uh, the culinary world. I, I watch a lot of things on cooking and, and things like that, that I think help broaden your perspective, right? Sure. Uh, I think the problem with education today is also uh, too focus centric. You know, you're an architect, you do that. You're an electrical engineer, you only do that. You're exact, you know, it categorizes you uh, into cells. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we need to broaden the way we think, the way we see, the way we perceive things so that we can be critical of our own environment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, thanks so much. This is super, super fun. I learned a ton. Um, if anyone wants to find you online, super easy. Um, look up uh, YYWAIWAI. Uh, thanks again. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.